In this video, we are going to prove a theorem. It's a relatively straightforward theorem. It says that if you have two different even integers and you multiply them together, then what you get out is going to be an even integer as well. But the real point of this video is not this particular theorem, but looking at how do we prove things? What is our process? What mental steps do I go through? And then even if I've managed to conclude for myself that my theorem is true, how do I present it in the right way, in a, a way that is accepted and convincing and compelling for everyone else to read and follow along my proof? Now, step number one, I've got some theorem and notice that it's got a bunch of words in it. It's got even integer, even integer, even integer. Uh, those are the main things and as well as everything else sort of filler and connective tissue. But the main word that we need a definition for is the idea of an even integer. And we might be able to come up with an even integer definition relatively quickly, but for more complicated theorems, focusing very precisely on what it means for each of these words is gonna be an almost necessary first step. So let's go back and, and before we even get to this theorem at all, let's investigate the idea of an even integer. So my sort of informal definition of an even integer is that it's an even integer if it can be written as twice some other integer. So for example, like six is twice three, or 12 is twice six, and so on. So if I can write my integer as twice some other integer. But I wanna be even a little bit more mathematically precise with this particular definition. I wanna use all of the fancy terminology that we've been developing in this course that has a lot of precision to it and will be very amenable to manipulating as we go on in our proof. So I wanna come up with a formal definition. Now, notice that in my informal definition, what I have is n is an even integer if there's an existence claim snuck in here. If there exists some number such that twice that number is what I began with. So that's what I want to note is that, that inside of this informal definition is an existence claim. You are claiming it can be written in some way and I want to express that in my formal definition. So here's how I'm going to translate it. I'm going to say that n that's my integer under consideration. And I'm gonna say that n is an even integer. That's what I'm trying to claim. And note that I'm now gonna put the biconditional symbol here. And the reason I write this biconditional arrow here is that all of these definitions work two different ways. The definition of even is gonna be the stuff I'm gonna write down. And then if you have the stuff I'm gonna write down, you're gonna get even. So. All definitions are if and only if. Anyways, I have n even, and, and what do I want to claim? I want to claim that there exists something. There exists some other integer such that your, your n can be written as twice this integer that we're describing. So I'm gonna get a given name for it. I'm gonna say that there exists a p, and I'm going to write it like this. There exists a p inside of the integer. So there exists some other integer, and then so that my n is equal to twice that other integer p. And that is going to be my formal definition. Note that you have some leeway here. I chose to use the backwards e for there exists and the, the e symbol here for element of and the integers to have this sort of real shorthand for the larger English phrase there exists a number p in the integers if you prefer to write down the larger English phrase, there exists a P in the integers instead of my mathematical shorthand, I have no objection to that. I just like being efficient on the board. All right, so back to our theorem. So now we know what an even integer is, and if we need to go in forward, we can always go back and recall that. But my next point is that my theorem that I have written down here is written a little bit informally, and I want to I want to clean it up a little bit. I want to say it in a little bit more of a precise manner. So I want to describe what my theorem says formally. The first thing I want you to note is that there's sort of a hidden universal in my informal presentation of this theorem. It says an even integer times an even integer is another even integer. But implicit in the way I phrase this is the claim Every single time I find those pairs of integers that are both even, every single time, then their product's gonna be an integer. So hidden inside of this is a for all claim. 
And so I'm gonna write that down first. I'm gonna claim that for all, my upside down A, for every, and, and notice it's an all claim about two different numbers. It's every time I have two different numbers that are even. So for all M and N, they're gonna begin as just generic integers. Then I'm going to have that if my M and N are even, that this is going to lead me to conclude that their product are, is going to be even as well. Then the product M times N is also going to be even. So the key thing in my formal statement of my theorem here is, is to note that it says for every time I take a pair of integers, if those pairs of integers that I get are both even, then their product is even as well. All right, so what we've done so far was step one, we formally defined the different terms in our theorem. And then step two, we, we took our theorem and we formally wrote it with all of our notational shorthands of the for alls, but, but most importantly, have, have formally written it in this very precise way that is gonna be amenable to manipulating and deducing our theorem. I also want to note that this, this theorem that we've stated here is in a very common form that a large swath of theorems are going to be. In particular, the format of it effectively is for all things in some domain. In this particular case, the things were pairs of numbers, both in the integers, but for all things in some domain, if you have an initial property, they're even, then you get some other property in this case that their product is even as well. So this format that we have for stating a theorem is gonna be one of the major sort of classes of how theorems are gonna be presented. Of course, the domain and the initial predicate and the final predicate, all of those are gonna change from theorem to theorem, but this logical structure is pretty common. All right, so what's next? So let's go back to our theorem and I'm gonna leave it actually in its colloquial form up here. I can bring in its formal definition when and if I need it, but I like it phrased in this convenient way. And remember, what we want to do is we want to write down some formal proof of this that is gonna convince everybody that yes, indeed, this theorem is valid. However, notice that I write this as step four because being able to jump immediately to a crystal clear, perfect proof is for most cases a step too far. In fact, what we want to do is step three, which is the most important step of them all. And that's the step that I like to call playing around. And this is where we try to get some sense for ourselves, not a formal proof, but why do we think this theorem is true? Can I write down a few examples? Can I do some algebraic manipulations? Can I get some sense of why it is that this thing is actually true. And once I have an idea for myself, then I actually can go back and, and fill it in precisely. So it's important that I'm able to do this. It's important that I'm able to come up with some sort of intuitive idea. All right, so let me just choose a, a couple different numbers here. How about four times eight, just to sort of get the ball going. And then if I think about what's going on here, we're gonna have some particular product. In this case, it's gonna be 32. And I know that four was even and eight was even and 32 was even, so at least I've, I've, I haven't just proven myself right off the bat. But then if I think about the four, our definition of an even integer, why do I think four is an even integer? Well, it's because it's twice some other number, in this case, it's twice two. And then the reason why I think that eight here is an even integer is it's twice four. So, that's the reason why I think that both four and eight are an even integer over they're divisible by two or they can be written in this manner, two times this times this. So then if I go down to my 32, which is the product of these two things, it's like, okay, it's twice two multiplied by twice four. All right. And then if I look at this, the way I think about this, is you know there's like a two there? And that's what we want it for it to be even, right? We want it to be two times a bunch of other stuff. This is like two times a bunch of other stuff. In this case, two times two times four. So I think that that works. 32 is an even integer because it's written as twice times blah. And the blah all came about because I sort of broke up my four and eight and I applied their definition and I put them together. 
So this is sort of my intuitive picture here. I can kind of imagine that the four and the eight don't really matter. It could be any M and N here, and I could get any values out of this. And then when you multiply them together, I think it should work. I'm not 100% sure yet, but I think it should work that you just sort of get the one, two that came maybe from the first one and everything else gets lumped together. All right, so that's my tentative intuitive picture why I think maybe this is gonna be true. But let's see whether we can formalize this properly with all of our precise definitions and fill out an actual proof. All right, so here we are, step four, we're going to be trying to prove this claim. And I want to note that the, the proof that we're gonna have here is gonna fit a relatively standard format. In fact, we don't really necessarily care about this particular theorem, although that's what we're gonna to use to illustrate the point, but the format is gonna be quite constant. Indeed, one of the first things that we're gonna to want to do is we wanna write down whatever our assumptions are gonna be. That's how we're gonna start our proof. We say, well, what do we know for sure? In this case, we know that we have two different even integers. That's what we know. And then we want to apply our definitions. Okay, you've got two even integers, so what? What does that mean? And then we had that really formal definition of what it meant to have two different even integers. And then in the middle, this is the part that really changes and varies from proof to proof, is we gotta do our playing around. This is where we use algebra, where we use logical implications, where we use facts that we've proven previously or that we've looked up somewhere. This is where we do all of our manipulations. And we try to take these starting assumptions that have been precisely written with their definitions and keep on massaging them using all these different tools until it looks like our conclusion. All right, so that's the, the basic structure that I'm going to be trying to put in place when I do my proof. I also want to note that I can bring over at any point my formal definition or I could bring over at any point my formal statement of my theorems that I have these here if and when I need them. All right, so first up was to state what our assumptions are gonna be. And in this case, the stating of the assumptions is that we are going to begin with M and N being an even integer. So this is my first line of my proof. Suppose M and N are even integers. Maybe the one thing I want to note about this line is this, that this line that I have here, suppose M and N are even integers, is I'm choosing my M and N completely arbitrarily. In fact, this is the same thing as saying for all M and N. If I just choose any arbitrary pair and prove it for an arbitrary pair, I've proved it for everything. So that's what I'm doing. I'm supposing that I've got two even integers and I'm giving them some labels M and N. Now, we next up, we wanna figure out how we apply our definition. So even integers meant specific things. So in this case, because they are both even, it meant that we got two other numbers and I'm gonna call these other numbers R and S. So I'm gonna say that there exists an R and an S so that the M is twice R and the N is twice S. So this statement here is me applying my definition of an even integer to the two even integers that I have, the M and the N. Next up, I wanna do some algebraic manipulations. We're trying to get to M times N, right? That's what our goal is. And we wanna show that M times N is an even integer. So maybe my first step is just to say, well, look, I've got my m times n. Let's substitute in the 2r and the 2s that I have for the m and the n, and I can write it down this way. So I've substituted in the values that I have for my definition. I've, I've related m and n to twice r times twice s. Next up is the little bit of algebraic manipulation that we saw previously when we were just sort of playing around and seeing what might be true. I, I've got one two inside of here, so let's pull that out the front and just leave everything else sort of hanging behind it. So I'm writing this as two of two RS. This property, by the way, is referred to as associativity. I also move one of the twos around. But these are properties that we know to be true from numbers, that we can change our brackets around and we can reorder things. That's perfectly fine. All right, so what have we got? We've got that the m times n is indeed gonna be written as twice something. But I need to, to really lock out my, my little proof here that twice something, the something should be given a specific name and noted that it is an integer. 
So that's what I'm gonna do next. I'm gonna say let t equal the, the 2rs. Letting all this stuff over here be given a name. And it is an integer. And the reason why this is important is that the, the t that we have, that was our existence claim. Remember when we talked about our definition of it being an even integer, there existed something in the integers so that whatever you had was twice it. That's precisely that statement. There exists a t so that the product is twice that. And the definition of this is that my mn is an even integer. And so I write thus mn is an even integer. And then I finish off my proof by loaded, putting this little square uh, symbol here that stands for, for QED. And we put that at the end of our proofs to be like, voila, we have successfully proven what we set out to prove. Now, in this formal proof, which I believe is convincing, and now that people who read this, they can apply it and agree that, that yes, indeed, the product of two even integers is an even integer. And, and this structure that we have has a couple different key components that I want to identify. First, I want you to look at the first and last lines. Well, notice if I read them together. Suppose m and n are an even integer, thus m times n is even. So in other words, what I have by reading the first and the last lines together is the statement of my theorem. And that's the way that it's supposed to work. You start by assuming the, the p of x and you get out the q of x. You start by your assumptions and you get your conclusion. And then if you read the beginning and end of your proof together, it should be the statement of your theorem. All right, next up, I want to talk about definitions. We use this a couple times. Notice that the first one is right here in the second line and down in the second to last line, I'm taking the formal definition of even and I'm, I'm applying it at both ends. And it makes sense that I'm applying it at both ends because in my statement, I begin with a claim about two even integers. And then I deduce a claim about even integers. So if I split that up to the start and the beginning, I sort of go in one level of applying the definitions right at the beginning and right before the end. And then the stuff in the middle here, this is going to be my manipulations. And, and this in general could be all sorts of different things. In this case, I have a little substitution, a little bit of associativity, a little bit of algebra to manipulate what I had in my assumptions into a form that looked like my conclusions. So this is the, the general strategy that I use when trying to prove things. And maybe I, we can summarize it like this. Step one, define our terms. That's what we did, we defined our even terms. Step two, state our theorem formally so we know exactly what it is that we're trying to say. Then, this is the most important part, step three, this is my playing around. This is me trying to figure out how do I know this theorem is true? Like, what's the key step? What am I going to put into my formal proof? By the way, you could do step three even earlier than this. Maybe you don't want to formally define things. You want to do your playing around ahead of time. That's also okay, although I will caution, it's often helpful, at least when we're starting out here, to, to go through this process of really formally defining what it is that I'm trying to state. That will help inform my playing around. But if you want to do some playing around at the beginning, and then some precise statements, then maybe a little bit more playing around, knock yourself out. That sounds wonderful. And then finally, we're going to go and do our formal proof where we start with our assumptions, we apply some definitions, we do our manipulations and our quoting of prior theorems, and finally we get to our conclusion.